All right. We are live. We are live, Elizabeth Williams. Fantastic. Yes. Welcome. Oh my gosh. We've already had so much fun. This is the best way to celebrate International Women's Day is in circle with other women. So welcome all of you who are joining us here on Facebook Live. I'm Liz Williams. I am the founder of Awe Partners, which is a social impact advisory firm that is dedicated to lifting up women and girls around the globe. I am joined, first of all, by my dear sister and colleague, Summer Joy Raymer, who is the co-founder of the SIGN Network. And SIGN uh, stands for Synergized Impact Network Exchange. It is a global alliance of social innovators committed to large scale behavior change through collaborative learning, innovation, and unprecedented unified action. And we are here together this week in celebration of Women's History Month and International Women's Day today. And we're gonna to touch on what that's about and the origins of that because we were just chatting about it. But for this month, we are hosting a week of interviews with women who are dedicated to making the world a better place. If you happen to be with us live, you are welcome to post comments and questions. We'll be watching the live feed there and we'd, be, we'd love to address those if you've got anything that you wanna share. So let me go ahead now and introduce this incredible panel of women. Uh, we're gonna start with Sandra Shaw Hardy. Amazing, amazing woman and I'm so honored she could join us today. She is an innovator, entrepreneur, pioneer and driving force. Motivated by the increasing potential of women and their money, she has devoted her life to empowering women to improve society through politics and philanthropy. With energetic commitment and powerful actions, she co-founded the modern women's philanthropy movement, dedicated 35 years to expand women's significant philanthropic impact. In 1989, she co-founded the Women's Philanthropy Network, which is now called the Women's Philanthropy Institute. Shaw Hardy is the sole author or co-author of six award-winning books on women's philanthropy three of which were groundbreaking, establishing the field. During this time, she presented galvanizing speeches, chaired seminal conferences, and collaborated with scores of prominent leaders. Sandra's knowledge, empathy, and passion led her to be called the mother of women's giving circles, linking giving circles to the democratization of philanthropy. In 2018, based on the success of women's giving circles in the US and her part in that success, she founded Women's Giving Circles International to spread the giving circle concept and women's ability to change the world through their philanthropy. She has held elected office in the US as the only woman on a board of 14 men and in 2016 founded Woman to Woman to advance US women political candidates. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you. I didn't write that. Martha Taylor did. <laughs> she did a great job. Did a great and, job. I, and you know what? This month is all about shining the spotlight on the amazing things women do. We typically don't want to toot our own horn, but we're going to toot your horns for oh, sure this week. So I'm happy to do that. Next, we have Jeannie Sager, who is the director of the Women's Philanthropy Institute. So as we said, Sandra was the co-founder of the predecessor of the Women's Philanthropy Institute, and now Jeannie is the current director. It's housed under the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy in Indianapolis, Indiana. WPI is focused on conducting and disseminating research that grows women's philanthropy. Jeannie leads WPI's efforts to translate research to practice, works closely with their National Advisory Council, and serves on the executive leadership team for the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Jeannie is a seasoned nonprofit executive with 25 years of experience in healthcare, higher education, and independent school leadership. She most recently served on the leadership team that created the IU Health Foundation. Nationally, she serves on the Board of Managers for the Indiana University Alumni Association and on the Advisory Council for WOC, Women of Color in Fundraising and Philanthropy. In service to women and girls, Jeannie is on the Board of Directors for Girls Inc. of Greater Indiana and Women for Change Indiana. Welcome, Jeannie. So glad you could be with us. 
Are you, um, you're not, yeah, you're unmuted. Okay, I just wanna make sure we didn't hear you, but yeah, you're good, okay. Um, yeah, there we go, okay. And look, okay, La Laura, Lauda. You got Laura. it. I wanna say it right, yep, she's Laura. Laura. Yeah. Okay, Laura, Laura Lopez Blasquez is um, currently the development officer for the Global Fund for Women, an organization that funds bold, ambitious, and expansive gender justice movements to create lasting, meaningful change. She strongly believes in local grassroots activists as agents of change in their communities and that there is no gender justice without racial, queer, immigration, and climate justice. I couldn't agree more. In her role, she works closely with supporters, connecting them to the work of the Global Fund for Women's partners and what they're doing all over the world to transform power and privilege for a few to equity and equality for all. Prior to joining Global Fund for Women, Laura worked in programming, fundraising, and education in various nonprofits, schools, and museums. Welcome, welcome. We're so glad you're here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. All right, well, let's dive in. Um, and I want to start with Sandra uh, because you have been, you have dedicated your life practically to women and philanthropy. And I would love to start with what were things like when you entered the field and what was the impetus for you creating this, the women, what is now the Women's Philanthropy Institute? Thank you. Well, I was a political fundraiser. And so that meant that I only raised money from men. I can barely, I, I work in both um, the state capital, Lansing of Michigan, and then I went to Washington, DC. And um, I had raised money here for, in Traverse City for local, uh, local races. So I, I met this woman when I went to Madison, Wisconsin at a uh, fundraising meeting and she came up to me her name was Martha Taylor mm -hmm. and she was a, a, a vice president for the UW Madison Foundation and she said um, I've been approached to write an article about career women in their giving and actually actually I have to back up she came up and she said um, are you interested in women and philanthropy mm -hmm. and I thought she meant us as fundraisers that's what because I didn't even know that women gave money. I've never, <laughs> I've never had a chance to ask them. And, and then she told me about this article on career women and their giving and would I be interested? Well, I was, and that's the beginning of a, a very long, wonderful mm -hmm. friendship, collaboration, books written, everything with, with Martha. So we wrote, we, we wrote this, but we didn't really know anything about it. So we, we looked up in, the, in an encyclopedia how to conduct a focus group because we thought that would be the best way. And we had two focus groups. One was, um, one was the baby boomers, which was her. Now understand this is 30 some years ago. Right. And we, I mean, the, the XY and all yeah. of those were not even born <laughs> right. yet. Right. And, and I was what I called then the new older woman hmm. um, because I was part of the quiet generation and we were not quiet. So we found out, we had these two focus groups and we found out, interestingly enough, that women gave for reasons that were the same in both of the focus groups. They, which we call the six C's of women's giving. Women give to change things, to make things better, they give to create something in response to a human need. They give because they want to commit to an organization. Uh, they give because they uh, like to collaborate with other women. And I remember going through these with Martha on the phone one night as, as we were writing our first book. And I said, but I can't figure out the, the last C because women want to have fun with their giving. And she said, well, how about celebration? <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, that, led on then to this long going, ongoing, wonderful collaboration. And um, I don't know, did you want me to talk a little bit about the Women's Philanthropy Institute and how it, that happened? 
Yeah, why don't you talk about that and then we'll we'll let Jeannie talk about what's currently happening there. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, it, it didn't happen overnight. There, there were several decades in between and it wasn't anything that we, well, I shouldn't say that. It was probably something always in Martha's mind. But um, just a couple stories to illustrate what happened. Um, there was an article in the New York Times in April of 1991 that people would have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to PR firms to get. But as it turned out, it was a stringer who was a, uh, for the New York Times, who was a graduate of UW-Madison. And Martha had started a, um, a philanthropy women group there in, uh, in Wisconsin because she couldn't figure out why women weren't giving to the university in the same ways that they were represented as students and alums. Mm. And so she came, this Stringer came uh, to uh, a luncheon that was at the president's house with a speaker. And um, it came out in, as I said, in the New York Times and people began writing from all over the country and women uh, from various universities and organizations. And so um, that, was, that was pretty much the beginning. We started a national network of women um, as philanthropists because it was impossible to keep up with all of the, all of the contacts that were coming in. Mm -hmm. That ultimately uh, became its own 501c3. Um, and that's when we took the name of the Women's Philanthropy Institute. We got a huge grant from the Atlantic um, philanthropies for any of you who were around during those days. And we were able to go all over the United States and have conferences, invite uh, women organizations, give speeches, do interviews. Um, and that's when we began writing our, our books. Um, and then we had a lot of information that we considered really important about how women, how women give why women aren't giving. Yeah. And our first um, people that we made most contact with were development officers. Ultimately, we switched over to working with uh, women donors. And um, we were really happy when Jean Temple from the Center on Philanthropy and our, our president then, Cheryl uh, um, Altenheimer, um, <clears throat> helped us move the Women's Philanthropy Institute to the Center on Philanthropy at Indiana University because we had all this data that we had collected, but it was not research like needed to be done. We were doing qualitative and it needed quantitative. Yeah. And so in 2004, the Center on Philanthropy moved to um, Indiana University. So. I guess you're next, Jeannie. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Yeah. And and they have, I mean, WPI is engaged in a tremendous amount of research, both on gender specific giving. So how is how are women giving different than men, for example, but then also really a focus recently on giving to women's and girls causes. And so Jeannie, I would love for you to address kind of what's come out of that research. What has been most revealing to you, would you say? So it kind of ties into what Sandra um, uh, talked about with regards to the origin of creating WPI. Um, so when we're looking at the difficulty and kind of looking at and measuring giving to women's and girls causes was that we didn't really have um, a way to do that. And so we wanted to develop um, an index to provide those who study and practice philanthropy as well as policymakers and the general public with a better understanding of the landscape of women's and girls organizations, um, especially the amount of private contributions that they receive. And so um, when we created the WGI, it, it is the only systematically generated comprehensive index of charitable organizations dedicated to women and girls in the United States. Um, and as Sandra says, if you're not studying it and you're not collecting the data on it, then how do you track growth, how do you answer questions um, that are often asked? Um, and so we wanted to look at giving to women's and girls the way the same and, and carve out the same way that we've carved out other subsectors yep. like public health and in the environment and so on and so forth. And so 
when we did that, um, what we were able to do is to determine that of um, the 47,000 organizations that are dedicated to women and girls causes, they receive only 1.6% of the total charitable dollars. And this was this is based off 2017 data. Um, and so what we wanna do with that now is be able to have that as, um, um, well, for some organizations, they've used it as a battle cry, <laughs> but something to gauge and to track and a, a number, a, a, a data point that we really feel like once now that we're tracking, we can, we, we can, we can make larger, we hope. Yeah. Um, the bigger piece of a pie. Is there any insight because that that I've just clung to that number since I saw that research um, because it's just uh, to me just it's just unacceptable like we have to change that and so what is there any insight into how that number can be so small particularly when we know we know that women tend to give if they're if they're in the driver's seat for giving they tend to give more than men and we also know that women tend to give to support women and girls so how can that number be so small is there any insight into that yet so I think that um, it really has to do with with naming it, right? So and 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 letting and let these organizations being able to have this data point to point to and say we you know we deserve a bigger piece of this pie. Yeah. Now one of the things that of course has come out um, and I think it's important to note about the WGI is the methodology and how we how we arrived at what qualifies as, a, as an organization that serves women and girls. Okay. Because as you well know, a lot of these larger organizations absolutely serve women and girls. And Lara is gonna tell us about this intersectionality yeah. between women and equity and social justice and climate change. And so a perfect example is most, um, you know, most organizations that feed the, you know, those who, yep. who in, in food banks, they're serving women. They're serving women and children, right? Right. I mean, that's who they're. That's who they're serving. Um, but they don't come out. They don't. They don't fall into the subsector of a women's and girls organization because because it's not their entire mission to serve right. women and girls. So 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 just you know for the audience to kind of understand one. There's an absolute intersection of all of these with the larger organizations. So if, for instance, another big uh, piece of the pie is public health. Yeah. Um, so many of those public health organizations um, that those dollars get, um, um, you know, directed towards women um, and, and, and children in particular. But we, we, we focused on women and girls organizations by determining that if 80% of your program expenses um, is, is designated for, for women's and girls, that means the other 20% of your work is done through a gender lens. It re would be really hard to do 100% of your work if 80% of your program dollars are going to women and girls without, without absolutely putting women and girls first. And so, right. so you know, we're not dismissing that, you know, a boys and girls club um, yeah. or other larger organizations. Millions of dollars do get directed to, to, to women and girls in that direction. But we really wanted to carve out this piece. Um, and it's precisely because, you know, the, with, by carving out this piece and this number, then these other smaller, as of now, organizations um, that serve women and girls, perhaps they can grow um, yeah. by leveraging, like by leveraging this research and leveraging this data. Yeah, I'm. I'm really glad you explained that because that brings some level of comfort that women and girls are being served, as you mentioned, by um, organizations that are focused on education or human services or health or international affairs, that type of thing. They certainly can benefit. But what we're really talking about is those organizations who are specifically focused on lifting up women and girls. And so, and we do want to still grow that number. It's still very, very important. Um, the other thing that, that had came out of some of the research was that the majority of giving focuses on reproductive health with family and gender-based violence a distant second. And I'm curious, Jeannie, if you want to comment on it, but Laura, if you'd like to as well, um, you know, so that takes some people aback to think that so much is focused on reproductive health, but to the point of intersectionality, it's hard not to focus on that um, to the exclusion, you know, of other things. So um, it, whoever would like to comment on why that may be and, and does it make sense? 
So, I, so again, kind of back to the research and why this is so important that this is a comprehensive longitudinal index. So that's a moment in time. Um, okay. So let's think about 2017. It was right after the uh, 2016 election. Um, we have a whole report um, uh, about um, kind of giving by women after 2016, um, yeah. referred to as rage giving. Yeah. So there was this push okay. um, at that moment in time yeah. uh, with regards to reproductive health, not only for private donors, but it also in terms of, of, of grants and government grants, and, and, and Laura might have a little bit more to say about that. But again, back to your point of intersectionality. Yeah. Um, so reprodu and, and Melinda Gates talks about this a lot. Reproductive health has everything to do with um, any effort with regards to gender equity and also you know, and issues of climate um, and social justice. I mean, if, if, we, if, if women can't kind of, um, uh, be able to control their health um, and their bodies. Yeah. Um, how do how do they get? How do we get over um, some the other inequities um, that that come with being being a woman and 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 being able to bear children? Absolutely. Well, let's go ahead, Laura. I'd love to um, let's talk a little bit about the Global Fund for Women, and then I know you can address this even more specifically because it's the work you're doing. But do you want to tell us just a little bit about the fund and what your focus is? Yeah, of course. Um, thank you so much for having me. This is really exciting and again, a really great way to celebrate today. Um, so Global Fund for Women, we really started with the belief that women's human rights are essential to social, economic, and political change all around the world. And our founders in 1987 formed women, and they were really frustrated by a lack of interest in funding human rights, women human rights at the local level. So they founded Global Fund for Women to mobilize resources for grassroots feminist movements directly. They knew that trusting local partners to drive solutions in their own communities would lead to meaningful lasting change. And I, we've talked about this a little bit, but they really believed that it was how we fund that was most important, not how much. How mm -hmm. we fund has the power to transform systems, structures, attitudes, and behaviors, both of the people who give and their recipients. Yeah. Um, so over the past 30 plus years as a feminist fund, um, we've actually provided a flexible core support to a diverse group of partners, about 5,000 groups across 175 countries so far. Okay. And we have supported feminist and grassroots organizers to end civil wars, get female presidents elected and secure laws protecting millions. And we began our work. <laughs> it's yeah. really Summer's given a two thumbs <laughs> yes, yes. We began our work really by providing that critical funding to these women led organizations. And then over time, developed a thematic approach, which uh, really focuses on groups whose issue areas aligned with our organizational priorities. So we have sexual reproductive health and rights. And also, just to speak to Jeannie's point, you're also talking about 2016 and that, or in 2017, that moment in time, we have the global gag war or the Mexico City policy, uh, which uh, the Biden administration, Harris administration just repealed recently, but it really um, did provide um, a limit on, or really just if anyone wanted government funding for public health, you couldn't use it for abortion. So we had a lot of partners where they had to choose between accepting, a lot of countries they had to choose between accepting you know, government funding from the US and not providing abortion services and also, or accepting that funding and not providing it. So really just we're trying to fill in that gap with the funding. So that was probably another reason why we have that um, that as well during that time. So you've got, is it five theme areas that you're focused on? Yes, yeah, so we, um, we had uh, sexual reproductive health and rights, um, economic justice, which includes um, domestic workers' rights and climate justice, and then freedom from violence. Yeah. And actually, as of July 2020, we embarked on a really exciting, bold, strategic new three-year plan where we're doubling down on our commitment to gender justice movement. So we're actually shifting towards an approach that allows for movements to determine their own needs and mm -hmm. allocate resources accordingly. And what we're going to do is eventually it's a learning process. We will be, instead of funding women-led organizations, we'll be funding movements as a whole. We've seen um, 
the research movements are how we achieve long-term sustainable change. And for our first year, we're focusing on five pilot movements. Um, okay. So we're focusing on abortion rights in East Africa, domestic workers' rights in India, um, fighting femicide in Palestine, and the Mafali movement in uh, Girls' Voice and Leadership the, and Agency in Cameroon. And then also um, we're focusing on another movement in Peru. We hope to eventually get to 30 gender justice movements that we're supporting. Wow, that's incredible. How do you choose those movements? Like, how did those five get chosen to start with? What are you, what do you think is most critical? So the way that we, <laughs> um, the way that we get started is really just trust. I would say that that's trust and listening. Um, okay. And we have, you know, as a feminist fund, like I said, we've been um, operating for over 30 years. And the majority of our staff are in the United States. We don't have um, any staff on the ground in the countries we work. So we have always relied on a really heavy network of advisors who are experts in their field and experts in their industry. And you know, through building long-term relationships with these advisors, as well as sister funds and other groups, um, we determined those movements based on our relationships and also where um, the movements were okay. at the time. So for instance, with our uh, movement in the movement that we're supporting in East Africa, they've had a lot of really great momentum recently um, in 2019 um, in Kenya, specifically the high court ruled to uh, decriminalize um, ab or abortion after rape in cases of rape. So that was, of course, we have a long way to go, but that was a really big win. So yeah. we're seeing these movements gain momentum. And oftentimes they just need, most of the time these movements just need better resources and more resources. And what makes these movements, what makes these movements so successful is they're these big networks and webs, but that's also what makes them really hard to access for donors and for allies. Yeah. So we're providing that core flexible support. We're, you know, providing spaces when, when we could gather, we were providing spaces for all the groups that were working on a specific area, on a specific, towards a specific issue in a specific area to really come together for these convenings. And also doing a lot of advocacy, just lifting up the work of all of our partners. We and just, so, you know, you gotta do it. Everyone's got, has their own part and we gotta do it together. Yeah, and I think, but I think it's really important that your approach is not, and I love this, and I think this is so important, is this is not we have the answers and we're going to tell you what to do and here's some money to do it with. No. This is you are the experts, you have the answers, we want you to lead this and we're just going to support you in whatever way we can and how yes. I can see that. Exactly, because yeah. they know, they know their own community, right? Sure. They know how to solve the challenges in their community. Um, they more often than not just need that support to do so. And is that what, do you focus specifically, I know there's a term grassroots women's organizations, GWOs, is that primarily the type of organization that you're supporting? Yeah, so um, yes, and also led by girls and other marginalized communities as well. Okay, okay. Um, tell me about participatory grant making. Yeah, um, so this is also um, a really exciting um, thing for us that we are um, starting to um, eventually we'll go into participatory grant making with our movements. So our movements are also the movements that we support will have these movement committees that will be made up of different activists and leaders, and they will be the ones that will decide where the funding goes in which groups within the movement get the funding because they know best. And wow, that's really powerful. So, so we believe that shifting, that's how we're gonna shift the power, shift the decision-making power. Too often the power lies with a lot of, you know, larger institutions, um, donors, typically, you know, in the global North who yeah. are the ones that are saying, here's the money and this is what you need to do with it, X, Y, Z but we're really shifting that decision-making power so that they can determine their own needs accordingly. That is so incredible. It's such a feminine approach. It's all about collaboration and partnership. And I just, I love that. And there's no hierarchy. So that's fantastic. Yeah. 
Tell me about with, when COVID hit, how has that impacted the giving that you've done? Yeah. yeah. There. Well, um, we all know that uh, unfortunately women are the ones that are most affected um, in times of crisis. Um, and unfortunately, 0.4% of um, humanitarian aid makes funding, makes it to women-led organizations in times of crisis. Wow. So we actually have a crisis fund that we officially set up in 2014. And what our crisis fund does is we get support directly to these groups. So when COVID hit, the first thing we did was just reach out to our partners in solidarity, you know, ask them what they needed, check in with them and just reassure them that the, the funds that they have from us are flexible. Um, they can use them for whatever they need in order to support their um, communities to make sure that their communities were healthy and safe uh, in the short term and then also in the long term. And we have, um, we give a variety of short-term and long-term grants through our crisis fund. And these um, grants really just support our partners who are the best and positioned in order to go into their communities and, and again, solve these challenges, right? We have, um, you're thinking about things as basic as you know, making sure not just hand sanitizer and, and so washing hands, but also uh, materials that are, you know, in the language that the community speaks, right? Yeah. Yeah. And making sure that everybody understands like what to do in order to keep healthy and safe and also what to do if you get sick, especially like at the beginning of COVID, I know there was a lot of confusion around that, right? I mean, like you're even here, we're talking about sanitizing our groceries. Yeah. We're not saying... So, how, you know, making sure that that's coming, that's in the language that you understand, but also from someone that you trust, right? right? These community groups have relationships with their community. They go to them um, for a variety of things. So why wouldn't they go to them in times of crisis? Um, we also have them setting up hotlines um, with lockdown, we've had a, an increase in gender-based violence and increase in abuse. So making sure that there's hotlines where uh, the community members can call for support. Um, we have digital security as well as everything's moving online. That's also um, something that we're, we're focusing on at Global Fund for Women, um, funding tech initiatives as well, because that is how we're, we've been doing the majority, all of our work for the past year. And I think how we're going to be moving um, and then, you know, that basic like shelter, sanitizer, you know, all of that, like I mentioned before, masks, gloves, all of that, just to really make sure they're keeping themselves safe. And um, we've allocated a little over a million dollars as of right now to our partners um, that are, you know, fighting um, and dealing with the re re repercussions from the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, incredible. Um, if women want to support Global Fund for Women. How do they do that? Yeah. Um, well, you could go to our website and um, send in um, a donation. Uh, we also really encourage um, spreading the word. Um, we have a wonderful, I know um, Liz, Elizabeth has um, shown our fundamental yeah. um, film series. Yes. So we have a wonderful film series, docu-series, five-part episodes that each episode um, documents a different activist in a different country working towards these issues. Um, the films are really beautiful. They're about 15 minutes. Old. And they, we really not only wanted to highlight the stories of these activists, but provide spaces um, for conversation. A lot, of, a lot of what we need to do is just talking about these issues. Yes. So I really appreciate yeah. this space yeah. uh, because you might, hear of something but if you're not always in it maybe you're not thinking about it so it's really important to raise awareness about these issues and support where you can and like I said it's it's not how much you give but it's how I think it's um we have a, a spark leadership council which is a young professionals group and they're um, a small giving circle as well and you know they learn about um, feminist philanthropy and then decide on, get, they pull some money together and then decide on um, where, what groups and what movements they're going to support. And I just think um, learning 
as much as you can and supporting when you can, however much you can is really, um, is important. And it, a perfect segue back to Sandra, because I really want to talk about this giving circle movement. It is really powerful. Women love it. And I do think that it might be the key to really uh, increasing the giving that is directed toward women and girls. Sandra, can you talk a bit about that, how that was started and then your involvement in women's circles in the US and now internationally and what's happening there? Sure. And I would like to talk later with Laura. Yes. <laughs> <about this. laughs> Yes. Um, well, I, I was on an airplane reading People magazine, and you know, you only read People magazines <laughs> yeah. when you're on an airplane. That's or right. We're a doctor's office. office. <laughs> True. And there was this article. It was, uh, uh, it was about a woman on the West Coast in Seattle, Colleen Willoughby. And it, there, there was a picture, and the three women were in her kitchen, and they were throwing their arms up. They were so happy. Because um, Colleen had Colleen felt, as so many of us have, uh, that women could be giving more, that her friends could be giving more money if they knew how to do it and where to do it. So yeah. she and these two friends organized the women's um, the women's fund. I think it's the Washington Women's Fund, not to be confused with the D.C. Washington yeah. Women's right. Fund. And um, it, it was interesting because it was uh, more than most women's giving circles have as a membership amount. It was 2,500. Okay. And 500 went to the endowment at the community foundation, which community foundations aren't always real anxious to get giving circles because they claim that to host them requires money. Yeah, or staff. Um, so uh, it's nice to set this this endowment up that that keeps them kind of happy. And then uh, another thousand of it, the women would give to no more than three organizations or institutions that they wanted to support. Might be their university and a couple of things in, in Seattle. And then the, the last thousand dollars went to this women's fund to be given out. So, um, so I, was the president at the time um, of our Women's Resource Center in Traverse City. That, that's our um, domestic violence program. And we always need money. And so I called, I got, got her telephone number and called Colleen and said, how do you do this? Mm -hmm. And she was more than happy to tell me. And three things that she said, I think are so important and are part of um, a, a booklet <clears throat> that I have revised that uh, it's a uh, workbook on how to establish giving circles. And uh, the first one was, don't have more than five people set this up with you. Mm. Um, and, and those five people should be people that other people want to be with. And um, the second thing was, don't do this really fast. Don't start asking people to become members until you have all your ducks in order. Okay. And the third was to be sure that you encourage everybody who's a member to participate with the grant making. Yeah. So um, I thought, well, we could do this in, in Traverse City. And I talked to just a few people about it. I, didn't, I wasn't even recruiting them. And they thought it was a marvelous idea. So we started this uh, it was called the Three Generation Circle of Women Givers. And my one friend who was, actually there were only three of us that were on this committee. Um, I said, well, we don't really know the whole way to do this. So we met at a coffee shop and we said, okay, first thing we have to do is the mission. Next thing, probably take more time than anything else, the name. And, and we went down through about 21 different different uh, steps that needed to be in place before we actually created this. And it was the easiest fundraising I've ever done. And uh, so anyway, we did that. And I was speaking at, I, I, there were about four other women's giving circles in the country that I'm aware of at that point. And I was speaking uh, one time to maybe the Association of Fundraising Professionals. And I remember standing up there and saying, talking about women's giving circles. They didn't know I was going to, but I did. And I said, 
Um, I, I can't believe that we started this in my little town of, of Traverse City, Michigan. And my dream is that there will be women's giving circles all over the United States in all the big cities. Well, you know that right now there are about 3,000 of them, yeah. more than just the big cities. And yeah. it wasn't because Colleen was doing all this or I was doing all this or some others were. Um, it's because women had taken control of their money. They consequently had taken control of their lives and they wanted to put their money in places that they cared about. So it was absolutely the right time. It was, you know, it was just, it couldn't have been a better time to do this. And so it, it just grew and grew and grew and grew. And um, then um, I, I spoke to um, a group of ambassadors' wives in London about three years ago, I guess. And I was supposed to talk about, well, it must have been more than that, because I was supposed to talk about why Hillary lost the election. Mm -hmm. and, and, but my friend that had invited me also knew that I was active with giving circles. So she said, well, you could mention that. Well, these women from 40 countries, philanthropy was a new concept to them. And so I have to say back when giving circles were started, there had been a philanthropy movement, which Andrea from, uh, from the WPI was, I remember she once said to me, you can't call it a movement yet. It's not a movement yet. <laughs> you have to work harder. You have to work harder. And uh, so, so they were fascinated with the idea of women's philanthropy, and they were most fascinated by the idea of giving circles. Yeah. And <clears throat> then we were Martha and I were invited by uh, someone from the University of Monterrey in in Mexico, and he wanted us to talk to their. Um, to, to women who supported the university about philanthropy. And so we were there, I think for two and a half days and, and um, I, I just mentioned women's giving circles. And again, they were thrilled. And then I went to a conference that was the North American Community, Community Foundations Conference in Mexico City, just a, maybe a couple of years ago. And uh, as I was, no, I, this was three years ago because as I was going there, I thought, you know, we should have an organization. And so when I got there, I had to change my name tag from Women's Philanthropy Institute to Women's Giving Circles International. Wow. I love <laughs> that. That's how it was created. Think on your feet. <laughs> right. I mean, that is such a great story. So you didn't do the 20 list of 21 and I got to come up with a name and this, you're like, boom, here it is. <laughs> right. 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 Well, we've had to backtrack a bit. The I'm sure, I'm sure. But yeah, right now, I, you know, what's happened in the last year has set us back. So, so we are moving forward. But uh, that that's how it it was created. And I found this wonderful woman who has created giving circles, women's giving circles in Ireland. Her name is Sandora. I think it's Kelso. And and I said to her just this morning. I mean, I texted her. I said. We need a Sandora and a Sandra to go to every country in yeah. the world yeah. and bring women's philanthropy and women's giving circles there because she started the first one in Ireland and there are lots and lots. It's the, it's the only country that I'm aware of that has a lot of women's giving circles. So we have become fast friends. Yes. And, and you isn't behind you, isn't the visual behind you actually where some of those international- Yes, are yes, like and there aren't that many. Yeah, we, but you've, you've got to fill that all up with pins. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but those are, I mean, you have been, you have been partnering with whoever it was in these organizations or in these areas that wanted to start those giving circles and your right. organization now helps them to get established. You right. have a protocol. There were, well, there, there are some like Shanghai has two um, and there's, there's two in, there's two women in Africa that would like to start them. Yeah. That's why we are, we are, um, we have to get some money. <laughs> we have to get some money. So that, that's our, the next thing that we're really looking for. So and let's make, sorry, go ahead. Jeannie. I was going to say, and the research, uh, you know, behind giving circles yeah. is really, is really um, 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 compelling um, because it, 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 back to this, it, um, 
notion of intersectionality. Yeah. I mean, giving circles really help democratize philanthropy. Right. Um, and that's very important for women in particular because mm -hmm. they, they, they aren't as drawn to this idea of, of philanthropy or, or, or may be hesitant about it because they don't see themselves. Absolutely. So, but they see themselves in giving circles because giving circles is about generosity. It's about, it's about helping your own community. Um, it's about, you know, one gift, one vote. Yeah. Um, and this idea that, and then it allows, it allows opportunities for women to step fully into leadership roles, yes. um, learn more about, back to Laura's um, 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 discussion about participatory grant making. It's exactly that. Mm -hmm. um, learning about the, the causes and issues that are in their backyard that they, yeah. that they can, that they can have, um, that they, they can, they can help. Um, so it's very, and it, so from an international viewpoint, I mean, Sandra's right on target it, in terms of how women globally um, yeah. um, witness and, and bear witness to giving, you know, giving circles it, it is very appealing to them. It is, and it's community building, and they women love to come together and make have an impact, you know, collectively. So, and just to explain, if, if someone's not familiar with it, typically a giving circle is set up, and you donate a specific dollar amount. And as Sandra said, it twenty five hundred is kind of on the high end. Typically, it's in the maybe five hundred dollars, a thousand dollar range. Um, but then you collectively determine where those funds are donated, and so you do have a say in it. It it's educate education as well. You really get to to understand how to be effective with your philanthropy, which is awesome. And so you can, you know, you can give through that circle, but then you can go out and use the knowledge that you have to give in other places on your own. Uh, on your own. Um, it also gives you an opportunity to be introduced to organizations that you might lend your other time, talent, treasure too. So um, you may decide to volunteer or you know do some skills-based project work for them or something along those lines. So it really is a great entree into philanthropy if you know you just haven't been comfortable or haven't been sure what, how to get started. So um, I love that. This has been a, an incredible conversation. We're getting close to our time. And before we wrap up though, I really wanna just um, ask each of you because this is such a challenging and uncertain time right now. And so many are wondering what next, where do we go from here? How do we come out of this? And so I would just like to ask each of you um, your last thoughts on what is it that gives you hope and, and what thoughts do you have that you want to share with the audience before we finish up for the day? Let's see, well, let's I'll start. start. I'll start. Good. Um, as bleak and horrible as the last four and a half years have been, out of it has come such an awareness of, of women. Um, mm -hmm. you know, somebody called it philanthropy rage. Or, um, and, and I, we've awakened my, my granddaughters. Oh my goodness, they, one of them said, you know, we were just sitting back and everything was on automatic pilot and we yes. didn't even think about things. And I, and I just feel like women all over are just poised to make a mark and whether it's in, STEM or athletics or giving circles or research, whatever it is, they, they're ready. And so are organizations. I don't know if you saw, you probably did, Janie, that Google is giving away $25 million for, um, well, basically for women and girls. You know? yeah. And I see that, I, I see it in the same way that I saw, um, fundraising officers, especially men, pick up on the fact that women had the money and that they should be going to them because yeah. back then I remember holding up a an ad, if you could imagine, in front of about 500 people of a Toyota ad showing that uh, women were buyers of, of cars. And at that time it was even 60% of the the buyers of Toyotas were, were women. So they began to pay attention to it. And I think now you're seeing um, corporations really paying attention to, to women and helping us. I mean, they're really helping us through the, the gifts that they're giving. So I'm, I'm, gen I'm an optimist anyway, but I'm really 
excited about what I see ahead. Oh, me too. Thank you, Sandra. And on that note, um, I actually have two things to share, if that's okay. Um, I am um, really hopeful about this conversation and how we are giving. Um, we're seeing a lot of women funders like Mackenzie Scott, like Melinda Gates, that are giving um, you know, big and unrestricted uh, flexible funding, which is really important. And I'm excited to see more of that and have more of these conversations. Um, and then um, I'm a, I'm a teacher, I was a teacher before. So um, young people and especially young girls are um, always inspiring to me. And I think we've seen it this year, how they've just shown up. Um, mm -hmm. They've been in the streets, they've just been on social media, just calling out everything. And at Global Fund for Women, we actually have an amazing group of um, 12 girls from 12 different countries that make up our Adolescent Girls Advisory Council. And yeah. they actually, we just piloted our first part participatory grant making with them earlier this year, where they um, invited some girl-led groups to submit proposals and then went through that whole process and um, ended up giving grants to all eight of them because they couldn't choose. <laughs> but <laughs> what was really amazing is that they are, you know, they need to be in these rooms too. It can't yeah. just be us, we need to have young girls in these spaces as well. Intergenerational leadership is super important. Um, so the fact that we're having all these conversations and the way that we're moving and the fact that these girls are, you know, right behind us and yeah. you know, picking up yeah. where we left off is really um, something that's giving me hope. Oh, agreed, I love that. And, and I'll, I'll wrap it up by saying that, you know, I think this moment in time um, has really um, put a spotlight on um, how important women have been um, in all of the ways that we, um, that, that our society functions. Yes. Um, and, and so while we have many challenges still ahead of us um, in this new era, when it comes to uh, coming out of a, a really a, um, a economic downturn that, that has disproportionately affected women. I mean, in December, all of the jobs lost, 100% yep. of the jobs were women's jobs. And that's a crisis. Absolutely. And um, so we're going to continue to face that. But what I'm hopeful about is um, how women have reimagined I mean, kind of doubled down on this. Um, and I really think that the spotlight um, we're going to get, we're going to get, um, we'll have more allies, I think, moving forward because people understand this, understand this better. Um, and back to Laura's um, um, example with regards to, I think there's also gonna be this new era in philanthropy, in, in women's philanthropy in particular, because more women are, are, are really understanding the importance of um, using philanthropy um, as agency um, and, 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 and stepping out of this traditional desire to be anonymous um, mm -hmm. and to work from behind the scenes, but really finding their voice. And I think that, that a piece of that is a generational piece. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, um, as, as Laura mentioned, that the idea that um, bringing younger women to the table um, and younger women expecting to have a seat at the table. Yeah. Correct. Um, and that makes all, that's going to make all the difference in the world moving forward. Um, and so I'm really excited about women leaning in and it's why WPI exists because women have um, more and more um, have increased access to education income and wealth. And those yep. three things are key predictors to philanthropy. And so it's absolutely natural that they would, they would begin to use their philanthropy um, as a way to really um, you know, create the, the, the world that they wanna see um, right. and lift them up. And when, and when women think about goals, they often think about their um, family and community. It is all, it is yep. all one vision. Yep. Um, so, so thrilled to be able to spend International Women's Day with, with all of you um, doing the Thank hard work on the front line. It's been incredible. And I we've got it just a couple of minutes. And I, Summer, do you want to, you said there are some questions. Do you want to grab anything? Uh, and look? Yeah, I mean, I just first want to just say, I am like so honored to be in this room with the four of you on this day. Like I am just like okay. in awe of what you have done and how you have chosen to 
lead and do the work that you're doing is just like seriously deep bows. I'm so inspired. I literally, all the hairs on my arms have been like sticking up the whole time, just in awe. Thank you so much. And yes, there are people all over the world commenting. Let me just share a few comments coming in. Wonderful conversations. Thank you all very much from Katrin, who's in Germany. And she also just is chiming in an organization. She's connected to uh, Liz and I through the Sign Network. Are you connecting with Seroptimist International um, or Zonta, their fundraising projects? She's just kind of chiming in, wanting to know if you're woven with that organization. Um, let me see some other comments, questions. Yeah, I'll just throw optimists in Germany. So yeah, um, Diane Kelly, this has been so informative. Thanks, Elizabeth, phenomenal inspiration. Um, Judy, P and G led lead with love effort may be a spin on this. I'm not quite sure what she means. Maybe okay. some of you do. Maybe something with Procter and Gamble. I'm thinking maybe is a ah, okay. lead with love. And then Judy also asked, Sandra, how many years ago was this? I think referring to the story you told um, in Seattle. Wanted, she wanted to know how many years ago. Yeah. So just lots of right, Sandra, really sweet. Was it about 30 years ago? Because that was when right. well, we you know, this... kind of launched it. The, the Seattle one was 1988. I think Colleen actually organized that one in 1986. And 1989 is actually when Women's Philanthropy Network was started. Is that right, Sandra? Oh, no. It no? Was, no, it was before that. It was before um, that. I have all these, I have all these dates in my head. Um, <laughs> did put in a chat for the speakers a link to an I'm, article about I'm, giving women's and girls causes that it I was 1988 okay when martha organized at uw and uh 1991 the national network began okay okay and Jeannie, you said you you put a link in the chat yeah, put a link into the chat for those who might be interested that maybe summer can put to, out to the larger I, audience. I'm, I'm doing it right now. About giving to women's and girls causes and the different ways um, you can lean into that. Perfect. Perfect. It is and there as well as your websites are in the live stream and Facebook page to um, just so people can connect with your work. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Anything else we need to, or we're good? Thank Summer? you. Yes. Doing the good okay. work. Doing this. Mm -hmm. Oh. Amazon. Thank you. This has been an absolute delight. I appreciate your being here, sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, and in particular, your compassion. And um, what gives me hope are women like you that are doing just incredible work and have dedicated your lives to lifting up women and girls. And so uh, together we will. And, and I agree. I think we are at the, um, I really think we've hit it. We know we've hit, we're, we're at a pivotal point on the planet. And I think we've hit that tipping point and um, mm -hmm. we will see and affect real and lasting change. So um, I'm hopeful about that. For those of you that are with us today, thank you. And this will continue, as we said, all week long tomorrow. Uh, we will be here same time, same place with Ellen Remmer. And we're going to talk about impact investing. So how you can invest to change the world and to lift up women and girls. So we'll look forward to that. Thank you all. Much love. And I look forward to what we're co-creating together. So thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.